obviously, uh, if I've been asked to speak on the subject of Jehovah's Witnesses, something tells me uh, you have a fair representation of the witnesses uh, here uh, on, on the island. Uh, how many of you have had them uh, knock on your door at some time in the past? Uh, everybody laughs, okay. How many, uh, how many found it to be an inopportune time to be trying to talk to the witnesses when they knocked on your door? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, it, it can be uh, a tremendous challenge for many, many reasons. Frequently it's because you are not uh, in the frame of mind or preparation. But in reality, uh, when you think about it, uh, these folks are normally spending five hours a week preparing to talk to you. And we might spend five minutes a year, grand total, uh, preparing to talk to them. So it's not really a fair battle. And in my experience, uh, most Jehovah's Witnesses who are regular in their doing what's called service ministry, where they're going door to door, and to even be considered a active publisher, and hence to be on what, what might be called the membership roles of, of the Watchtower site. They don't really have membership roles, but they do re re report the number of active publishers. Uh, an active publisher needs to do 10 hours a month. Uh, now, I would ask you to think for just a moment. How large would the Southern Baptist Convention be if the actual number of Southern Baptists was based on how many had spent 10 hours in a month going door to door on outreach? Ten people. What's that? Ten people. <laughs> would it be one of the largest Protestant denominations? No, it wouldn't. And uh, yet there are, uh, uh, I've got the specific number in here, but. Uh, uh, nearly 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses who fall into that category. And so you start doing the, the math and you discover that it's a, a very large group and a, a much, much more dedicated group than uh, almost any others, to be perfectly honest with you. There are a lot of things about the society. Um, they're, they're very um, interracial. Uh, racially mixed, uh, there aren't, they don't really have issues along those lines. That's something that's to be said for them. As I said, uh, you know, you see them going door to door and, and uh, uh, even in Hawaii they wear their uh, ties um, and not for the reasons that certain people are wearing their ties today. Um, <clears throat> who we won't mention on video uh, because that would be really mean of me to do that, so I won't. But you can email me if you want the details, but anyways, um, uh, I mean, you know, they're dedicated folks, they're out there with their families, and uh, as we get into what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, I think you'll have to agree with me that what the cults will do for a lie, most Christians won't do for the truth. And it, it should be, I hope it is, somewhat um, challenging to us to realize that at this very moment, there are hundreds if not thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, going door to door, uh, most doors are slammed in their faces, and for most witnesses, the primary witness they have of Christian truth is from behind a slammed door. Go away, you're a cult, bang! And while the statement may be true, uh, every former Jehovah's Witness that I know of who has embraced Christ, I know a lot of former Jehovah's Witnesses, after the 1975 failed prophecy of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, over a million people left the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. But 99.9% .9 of them did not end up in a Christian church. 99.9% .9 of them ended up as the religiously abused, the burned out, the we will never uh, darken the door of any religious institution again people. And even the witnesses who are still a part of the society, and they continue to grow, not at the speed that they used to grow, but they continue to grow, at a, certainly a higher speed than Southern Baptists are growing. Um, those witnesses believe that they are part of the great crowd. They do not believe that they are in Christ. They do not believe they have the benefits of justification. Uh, they cannot partake of uh, what we would call the Lord's Supper. They are only partially justified, and they will not live forever in Christ's presence. They will live on a paradise earth, and if they mess up, while living on the paradise earth, they will be wiped out. It's called the doctrine of eternal insecurity, at least as I would identify it. They don't have a whole lot of reason to be happy and to rejoice. They really do not. 
And so um, I hope that as we think about these things and as we uh, look at the situation these folks are in, we will be challenged to realize that if we have the truth, they need to hear that. And we don't have to track them down. They'll track us down. Now, of course, after you have your first really decent conversation with a pair of Jehovah's Witnesses, there will be a big invisible X drawn on the front of your house. I've watched it happen. I've, I've, been, I've seen them on my, on my block, you know, and, okay, here they come, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, and uh, they go to the neighbor's house, and then, and then they go to the other neighbor's house, and they don't even look at my house because they know that uh, one of those terrible active opposers lives there. And so that's the term that they use. They have their own uh, uh, whole bunch of terminology that um, be careful if you do learn it in using it, because if you use it, they'll assume you're a former Jehovah's Witness, and Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to have any com contact, communication, conversation with a former Jehovah's Witness. And so uh, they act actually use that. I remember very clearly one Jehovah's Witness woman insisting that I was somebody else. You're a former Jehovah's Witness. No, ma'am, I have never been associated with the Watchtower Bible and Tracks. No, you're a former. I know who you are. Your name is Chuck Love. <laughs> and I, I got out my driver's license. Those things can be faked. You're Chuck Love. You know, and, and we're getting out of here. And, and, and uh, I know that I knew who Chuck Love was. And uh, I knew he was a former Jehovah's Witness. But it wasn't me. Uh, but that's how deeply ingrained uh, the idea of shunning really is. And um, so you, you need to be careful in the encounters. Uh, the, if you, if you, you, see, if you let on that you know where they're coming from, the witnesses have been taught to look for uh, sheep-like individuals who are willing to be led. And if you are... Uh, one who is going to give an answer and you're going to uh, defend your faith, they're just going to move on. So you either have to be careful in how you, you make the presentation. I have an advantage. When they come, uh, I, when I, I flew into Hilo uh, last Saturday, a uh, week ago today, um, as soon as I got my bags, I look over and here's a guy in a, in a tie and he's got a bunch of publications out on a bench and I knew exactly who he was. So I went straight over to him. Uh, the pastors are trying to find me out in the pickup area had to come in and find me because I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness. And he was a Baptist until 1999 when he became uh, a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and uh, looks like, uh, we had I had said, could we have, I didn't have a chance to say much to him there, but I, I, I started off my conversation with him. This is my advantage. I said, well, you know, I'm a professor and I lecture on what you all believe. So I tell them right up front, I know where you're coming from, I've studied your beliefs, uh, and so I just give, I just, in fact, what I do when I speak with Jehovah's Witnesses, I say, could I summarize what I tell my classes about what you believe and get your feedback on it? And they're like, sure, you know? And then I just give them the absolute best possible accurate summary using their own language and references from their own materials, and they're just blown away. And it always buys me at least some time to then give a witness to them. How long depends on the individual. Uh, but um, if you're not in a situation to do that, then you need to be careful as you approach them. But I'm getting ahead of myself talking about witnessing to them before I've actually explained to you uh, where they're coming from. We need to understand where they're coming from. You understand what they believe. And so I'm going to go through the primary issues with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, one thing to keep in mind, we're going to be talking about two different groups today. And while they are the common folks who are knocking on your door. You know, it's either two young men in a white shirt and tie on, on, on uh, mountain bikes, uh, or it's, uh, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses with their Watchtower and Awake magazines. Very rarely is it uh, some other group other than those two. They're the ones that are known for doing the cold calling and, and we might have the opportunity of talking to them. And in looking at these two groups, what you're going to discover is, this morning, we are going to be looking at a narrow range of topics, Jehovah's Witnesses, but something that you need to know in depth. It's a narrow range of issues that we have with the society, but you need to know the material fairly in depth. With Mormonism, it's the exact opposite. It's a wide range of topics but you don't need to know it all that in depth. 
And so narrow range, need to know it well, witnesses. Wide range, Mormonism. And it actually makes it a little bit easier to summarize the witnesses. But the problem is you will find witnesses who spend the entirety of their life studying these issues to an incredible depth. And they're very, very difficult to deal with. In fact, I would say that a witness who is a pioneer minister, a pioneer minister is someone who spends a minimum of 30 hours a week going door to door. Uh, at least that's the way it was a number of years ago. It could be more than that. I know that uh, I, I met a pioneer minister once that was doing 90. Um, those individuals are so actively involved and so constantly training and reading that they, would, they are more than a match on issues regarding the deity of Christ and the Trinity for almost any seminary graduate that I could, that I could name with a Master's of Divinity on almost any decent seminary let alone the not-so-decent seminaries, which predominate today. So we're talking about people. Uh, I hope uh, you, you will not leave this time and jump on your, on your uh, white horse and head off to the local kingdom hall to save Jehovah's Witnesses. In all likelihood, you'll end up being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Um, this is introductory. This should be challenging. This should be, wow, I need to know a lot more about the deity of Christ. I need to be memorizing more scripture. Because these people know their Bible. The problem is their Bible is a perversion. It is a mistranslation. And in the second part especially, we'll be looking at more of that. But way too long an introduction. What is it about this pulpit? I just wax on and, and, and the clock goes fast. It's really, I feel like I just started and we're 20 minutes in. I've only got 25 minutes left. I mean, this is weird. Uh, I mean, last night, I went over time. I never go over time. I'm the guy at the conference that gets the conference back on time. And here, it's just, it, it's the shirts. I just realized. I'm in an Aloha shirt. And it's sort of like, da, 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 da. Let's, let's tell another story. Hey, the trade winds are blowing. And it's just like, in fact, it's getting a little warm. I pop, pop those, uh, let, let some of that nice, cool breeze through here. Uh, anyways, all right, what are the primary issues? <laughs> Number one, Jehovah is the only true God. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society will identify themselves as monotheists, as we are, but they are also Unitarians. Now, I don't have time, uh, if, if we were just doing a, a, a lengthy week-long seminar or something like that, we'd probably want to fit in my presentation on the Trinity. I have a book called The Forgotten Trinity that a lot of people have found to be very useful. It's used as a textbook. Um, I can't spend too much time uh, during our time together going over basic Trinitarian proof texts and how to understand the doctrine and things like that. That is obviously vitally important if you're going to be talking with Jehovah's Witnesses because from their perspective, that is the key issue and they are very well trained at asking the difficult questions and, uh, as I said, normally are more than a match for most of the ministers of the churches uh, that, are, that are out there today. And so understanding the doctrine of the Trinity, understanding we believe that there is one true and eternal God and that that one being of God is shared by three co-equal, co-eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. We do not believe Jesus was the Father. Jesus was not a ventriloquist at his baptism. Uh, he was not praying to himself in John chapter 17. It's the Son who became flesh, not the Father, not the Spirit. Understanding those issues regarding the Trinity is extremely important. Uh, because the witnesses are excellent at finding out where you actually don't understand the doctrine and then pounding that to death. All right? So they are Unitarians. We are Trinitarians. That means we're both monotheists, but they believe there's only one person sharing the being of God. We believe the Bible reveals there are three persons that share the one being that is God. Now, most Jehovah's Witnesses don't even realize that we know the divine name Jehovah. Now, that's not how it was originally pronounced. There is almost no chance whatsoever uh, that Jehovah was the uh, original pronunciation of what's called the divine name. Uh, most scholars would say that the divine name was pronounced Yahweh. And in the Hebrew, it's called the Tetragrammaton, three letters, yod He wau He, And uh, it is used thousands of times in the Old Testament. 
Uh, most English translations, unfortunately, do not render it. I think that we should render it and let people know that it's there. You can always tell in your English translation when you're looking at the name Jehovah or Yahweh because in the English translation, it will be L-O-R-D in caps. The O and the R and the D will be in capital form, but a smaller font size over against the standard L-O-R-D, which is the Hebrew term Adonai. And so if you see Lord God and God is in all caps, but the smaller O and D as far as the font size goes, the underlying Hebrew word there is Yahweh. And it's used thousands of times in the Old Testament. Most Jehovah's Witnesses don't think we even know that. Uh, when they find out, for example, that uh, we use the Trinity hymnal in our church and there's all sorts of uh, before Jehovah's awesome throne is, uh, is, a, is a hymn all Reformed Baptists know. It's all, we, all our kids are brainwashed into knowing before uh, Jehovah's awesome throne. And, um, and so when they find out there are people who actually do know uh, the divine name, uh, that can sometimes throw them for a loop. And it, in fact, as we, uh, especially during the Q&A time, I'll probably uh, mention to you one of the best ways to approach Jehovah's Witnesses is through those texts that identify Jesus as Yahweh, uh, as Jehovah in the, in the New Testament. And so that can really catch their attention. But they believe Jehovah is the only true God. They are Unitarians, uh, and that's something very important to keep in mind. Now, second issue. Michael the Archangel is Jehovah's first and only direct creation. Please notice I said direct. Jehovah has only, without any intermediation, created one thing, and that is Michael the Archangel. All right, so Jehovah has created one thing, Michael the Archangel, he then becomes the master worker so that, point number three, all other things were created through Michael. So you think about um, wisdom in the Old Testament, uh, you think about maybe the word of God, there's various ways that it's been described, but you have this master worker and this Michael then becomes the mechanism, the means by which all other things are created. And I put other in quotes for a particular reason. Uh, as you'll see, this will come up when we look at one of the mistranslations in the New World Translation. You'll see how this is, this is relevant. But, so Michael is a created being, but he's the only one directly created by Jehovah. And then through Michael, everything else is created. He is not the creator himself because he himself is created but he is the master worker by which all other things have been made. All right, that's Michael the Archangel. Point number four, Michael became Jesus. Michael became Jesus. Now, uh, what you need to note here, and I hope I do not cause um, any problems with the microphone if I walk down front here. Uh, what you need to note here is that the arrows that I have put here are purposeful. Now you see how you can barely see that right now? Now watch this, sorry about this, Mr. Uh, cameraman, person, professional, and all that stuff. <laughs> the farther back I get, the brighter it gets. It's the, angle. it's the angle, and when I get back here, you can actually see it. Yeah. So um, I don't know why that is, but that's life. The, the arrows are purposeful. That is an arrow going that direction, uh, right there. That's a beginning point, that's a beginning point. Those are two uh, sort of end points. Michael comes into existence here. He exists for a certain time as a spirit creature. Then he ceases to exist and Jesus comes into existence for 33 years. He then ceases to exist. Michael is recreated and he continues to exist for eternity. Okay, so what you need to understand is that the witnesses do not believe that man has a spiritual nature. Uh, you do not have a soul, you are a soul, you're just a living being. And so there is no spiritual aspect to man. And there was no spiritual aspect to Jesus. So it would be inappropriate to think that Michael, a spirit creature, indwelt a man, Jesus. That's, that's not, you'll notice there are no lines connecting these. Michael exists as a spirit creature and then comes out of existence at the point in time that the man Jesus comes into existence. He lives for 33 years and then he comes out of existence and Michael is recreated 
and then he continues to exist to this day. There is no line that connects these two because there is no spiritual existence of man that would allow there to be uh, any connection there. And that's the same thing with us as well. This is one of the great sad things uh, about Jehovah's Witnesses, is that they believe that when they die, they will cease to exist. It's a full-on soul sleep concept. But what's worse is that resurrection for them is not what resurrection is for you and I. The Greek term anastasis found in the New Testament means that which died coming to life again. When Paul mentions the resurrection on Mars Hill, that's when the people begin to mock. Because in the Greek way of thinking, salvation was the spirit being freed from this physical body. And so they understood that when Paul was using the term anastasis, he was saying that that which died was going to come to life again. And that was just the opposite of what they thought salvation was. So we believe in resurrection, that which died coming to life again. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in that definition of resurrection. Instead, their resurrection is that they die, they cease to exist, and then when they are resurrected, Jehovah recreates them based upon his perfect memory of who they were. So there is no direct connection. It's almost a science fiction idea, and I can't help but think uh, that many a Jehovah's Witness has thought about that teaching and realized that's not really going to be me. I mean, it's going to be some other creature that's recreated, might have my memories, but it's not really me. Uh, which is a, a frightening thing. I mean, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses lose loved ones just like we do. And yet, they, they have so little hope and so little, um, and, and to think they do so much for so little is truly a, a, an amazing thing to consider and, and, and to think about. So anyways, it's important to realize that the Jesus that the Jehovah's Witnesses are speaking of is Michael the Archangel. Uh, that, is, that is who their Jesus is, and uh, he is therefore the one through whom all other things came into existence. So, so Jesus, in Watchtower theology, is a creature. He is the first, most exalted, and greatest of all of Jehovah's creatures. But he's not Jehovah God, he's not deity, but he is an exalted, now, today, spirit creature, also known as Michael. All right? So, there's first four points. Point number five. The Holy Spirit is a force, not a person. Uh, I do not know if the society contemplated suing uh, Lucas and Star Wars for uh, their obvious ripping off the force concept, but uh, I don't think that they did. Uh, the Holy Spirit is God's impersonal, active force. The Holy Spirit is God's impersonal, active force, similar to the electricity that's running through the lights above our heads, uh, water running through a turbine. It's a force. It can accomplish something, but it's impersonal. Okay? Uh, so much so that in the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, I stole Shane's copy here for purposes today, um, in their own self-published I, I really hesitate to call it a, a version of the Bible. It is a perversion of the Bible. Uh, it is a purposeful mistranslation of the Bible without any, without any question about that. But uh, in the New World Translation, you will notice it, will, it says, for example, that one will baptize you people with Holy Spirit. Small h, small s, no article. Just like he will baptize you with water, he will baptize you with electricity, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit. That is how it is consistently rendered in the New World Translation uh, published by the Society. Or, and he will be filled with Holy Spirit right from his mother's womb, Luke 1.15. Or Matthew 1.18, she was found to be pregnant by Holy Spirit before they were united. Now, you may have noticed even just from those few uh, references... Uh, that reading the New World Translation is as exciting as chewing aluminum foil. Um, it is a horrid translation. It is just, uh, to say that it's wooden, it means, uh, I mean, you'd get splinters from reading this thing. It's just, it's just that bad. 
Uh, but we'll have more to say about the, uh, the New World Translation. Have you gotten the idea I don't like the New World Translation? Is that, have I communicated that? Okay, I just want to make sure. You know, it can be early on a Saturday morning, you didn't have enough donuts or something like that, and so you might not be catching that, but just wanted to make sure it was clear that there's a, 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 small, amount of, a small amount of animus on my part toward the uh, New World Translation, as we will see. Number six, Jehovah has an organization, the faithful and discreet slave of Matthew 24, 45. If you think about Matthew 24, remember the faithful and discreet slave uh, who, even though his master is away, uh, you know, he doesn't act like the master's away, he remains faithful, so on and so forth. Uh, this, the society identifies with themselves, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society based in Brooklyn, uh, New York. And if you want to know all things Watchtower, uh, their uh, website is watchtower.org. And uh, that's where you can get official uh, information, so on and so forth, uh, about the Watchtower Society. This is Jehovah's only organization on earth. There, are, there is not a, a group of organizations. You are either associated with the Watchtower Bible and Tr Tract Society or, or you are in rebellion against Jehovah God. Um, that's all there is to it. It's just that simple. It's a very black and white world uh, for Jehovah's Witnesses at that, uh, at that particular point. Number seven, there are three groups in salvation. I remember very clearly one of the first theological things I remember as a young person, I grew up in a pastor's home, um, was the fact that when we lived in Pennsylvania, uh, right across from my backyard was a kingdom hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so, you know, my dad told me, well, these people believe that only 144,000 people are going to heaven and, and uh, you know, all the rest of this stuff. And uh, uh, it was right around the time where they had the 1975 prophecy. In fact, we left Pennsylvania in 74. So they were ramping up to that. And, and uh, I, I just remember a lot about those, uh, those folks. And so the first group is called the anointed class. Now, what's the word anointed in Hebrew? Anyone? Mashiach, Messiah. That's what the Messiah means, the anointed one. And the Greek word for anointed is Christos, Christ. So this is the Christ class. The Christ class. And it's made up of 144,000 individuals. No more, no less. It's not meant to be taken as a non-literal number, anything like that. Um, they may be moving toward that now, to be perfectly honest with you, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, it has always been taught to be 144,000 literal individuals from the time of Pentecost until the Battle of Armageddon. That's not a lot of people over 2,000 years period of time. That's a, that's a, fair sm that's a fairly small number of, of individuals. Uh, the anointed class would include everyone. Uh, basically, this would be directly connected to uh, what we would identify as salvation. These people are in Christ, they are justified, they're in the new covenant. Um, and if you ask, well, how do you know whether you're, you're one of the anointed class, I'll answer that in, in just a few moments. Uh, right now, I'll just have to skip that and sh show you how this works later. There is very little chance, very, very, very little chance that the witness knocking on your door or passing out watchtowers at the airport claims to be of the anointed class. The vast majority of the anointed class today is found only in Brooklyn, New York. So if you're visiting Brooklyn, you might run into some folks who call themselves uh, of the anointed class. But uh, very, very, very small chance that you would run into someone on the island who claims to be of the anointed class. Instead, the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses, 99.99% of them, are part of the great crowd. The great crowd. Uh, and they do not, they, the, the terminology they would use is that the anointed class has a heavenly hope and the great crowd has an earthly hope. So the 144,000, when they die, they are resurrected as spirit beings and they rule and reign with Christ, who is one of the 144,000, because it's the Christ class. Um, the great crowd are resurrected as physical beings and they live forever on a, in a paradise earth. And that, therefore, you know, I, if I really want to cut to the chase and talking to Jehovah's Witnesses and say, do you have a heavenly hope or an earthly hope? That's not the type of terminology we normally would use, but that's the type of terminology. That's their language at that point. So 99.99% of the people that you will talk to at the door 
uh, claim to be of the great crowd. And then it's real easy. I mean, Watchtower Society thought and practice is black and white. Then there's everyone else. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Eastern Orthodox or Assemblies of God or a Buddhist or a Mormon or a Muslim. You're all just everyone else. You are apostate religion. You are uh, uh, under uh, Jehovah's wrath. That's just all there is to it. It's just that simple. Uh, that's, uh, those are the three groups. When Armageddon takes place, um, whenever that is, and it's always held out to be, it could happen this very day. When Armageddon takes place, then uh, everyone who is not associated with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society will be wiped off the face of the earth. And if you die in that judgment, you will not be resurrected. If you die the day before that, you will be resurrected during the millennium, taught Jehovah's ways, and given an opportunity to live forever in paradise on earth. But there will be a great test at the end of the millennium, and even Jehovah's Witnesses of the great crowd do not have any guarantee that even they will pass the test of faithfulness at the end of the millennium. There, just, there is no concept of, of acceptance and security in Watchtower theology. It's just, it's just, it's just not there. And so you can see in, in the mind of the, of the follower of the Watchtower, they've been taught that if, if they listen to what you're saying, and they, in their heart and mind, disassociate from the society and embrace what you're talking to them about. And Armageddon happens the next day, they're going to be wiped out with no opportunity of resurrection whatsoever. They'll never have any opportunities whatsoever. They'll just be wiped out. And so that's sort of one of the ways the society keeps its people in uh, is by basically saying, you never know. I mean, if, uh, you'd have to be absolutely certain that we're wrong. Because if we're right and Armageddon happens tomorrow, so much for you. You don't have any opportunity of, of resurrection. Okay? Now, I said that there's an interesting way that they know basically exactly how many of the anointed class are still left on earth. Not I, exactly, but they've got a good idea. This is how they know. The society uh, has what is called the Memorial Supper. And it takes place on Nisan 14, that is the day of Passover normally the Thursday before Easter in, uh, in our calendar. In 1974, 1974, click, there we go, 4.5 million people gathered around the world to observe the Memorial Supper, but only 10,723 of those 4.5 million people actually partook of the elements. Let me explain what that means. When you see the Kingdom Halls around here locally, if you've stopped and looked at them or visited or something like that or just stopped and maybe read the sign outside, you'll see there are a number of congregations that meet in that kingdom hall. In, in Phoenix, it's very common to have two English and then one Hispanic or two Hispanic and one English uh, congregations meeting in a particular kingdom hall on a staggered schedule, which makes sense when you think about it. I mean, you build one building and you have three different congregations that can utilize that one building. Not only does that make economic sense, but you've got three different congregations that are helping to maintain the building as well. And so you have that going on. How then could everybody meet at once on one night? If all three congregations met at the same time, the building wouldn't contain it. And so what they do is they rent halls, lecture halls, library meeting rooms, uh, high school auditoriums, et cetera, et cetera, for that one night so that all Jehovah's Witnesses and all people interested in Jehovah's Witnesses can meet at one time. That's a, the number there then represents much more of the, the people, the range of people that the society is impacting, is that number, much more than even the active publishers. What would happen then is the elements, the, the bread and the wine, are, are passed down these rows and the elders walk along the sides and they are watching very carefully and in the vast majority of those meeting places the elements are simply passed by by every 
person in the room. The bread will get to the back of the room untouched. The wine untouched. But they're watching. And if someone partakes, they make note of that. Now, if they don't know who you are, and you don't have a lengthy history with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, they're not going to consider your action to be relevant. But especially around Brooklyn, you're somebody who's been with the society for 40 years, you're in leadership, you partake. That is your way of stating, I am of the anointed class. Because the, the Lord's Supper is the new covenant meal. And by partaking of it, you're saying, I'm part of the new covenant, and only the anointed class is in the new covenant. The great crowd only has the benefits of association with the anointed class. So it's a two-tiered system. I, I remember this one. I need to find this. Every time I do this presentation, I, I go, I keep forgetting to do this. There's this great graphic. It's on my blog. I just need to look it up and stick it in here. I was actually looking at this going, I knew there was something I needed to put in here. What was it? Now I remember what it is. I'm staying here. Um, maybe during the break I can track it down if I can uh, get online. There's this great graphic uh, that the society has produced where you have the great crowd and they're looking upward. But they're not looking at Christ. They're not looking at Michael. They're not looking at God. They're looking at these, this small group of elderly people. They're looking to the anointed class and the anointed class is looking up to heaven toward Christ. So you see the, the, the average Jehovah's Witness, he gets the benefits only as he is associated with and, and dependent upon and obedient to the anointed class. And then the anointed class has direct access to God. All right? So what we have then is in 1974, 4.5 million partook. I'm sorry, we're there. 0.24% uh, partook. Look at the percentage. That's the important thing. In 1985, 0.7 attended. 0.17% partook. 88, 9.2, around 9,000 partook, about 0.1%. 1994, 12.28. See the numbers going up? 12.28 million attended on the Memorial Supper. 0 0.07 partook. 2001, 15.3 million. 0.056% partook, though the number went up slightly. Remember, these are older folks, so they, they don't really worry themselves too much about that. And 2008, the last time I could get numbers on the number of partakers, and this is an interesting, they're not telling us the number of partakers anymore. But the last time I could get numbers, 17 point, almost 8 million people worldwide attended the Memorial Supper. Remember, there are only 14 million Mormons, and that includes every Jack Mormon on the planet. So you've got 17.8 million people worldwide gathering for the Memorial Supper. And again, about 0.056% uh, partook of all of those people. Now, the reason for this and the reason that the number is going down, I will explain after we take our break. That means you have to come back. And I know you're sitting on pins and needles. You're not even going to be able to eat anything. Uh, because you're going to be so excited to find out why that, why is that number going down? I've always wondered. Um, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll take our break now and uh, reassemble at 10 o'clock. Okay? So, we were looking at uh, the uh, Memorial Supper, and we already looked at all these numbers. Now, the number's going down. Why? Well, because of what is called the... 1914 prophecy. The 1914 prophecy. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society teaches that Christ returned invisibly in the fall of 1914, ushering in the last generation of Christians on the earth. Hence, one generation from 1914, Armageddon will take place. Now, if you're doing math, uh, that was a long time ago. And by almost any stretch of the word imagination or a generation, uh, we're well past that generation. In fact, initially when the 1914 prophecy came in, uh, the idea was you had to be a certain age. You had to have eyes of understanding in 1914. You had to be at least 10. Uh, most people who were born in 1904 are not around anymore. There are very, 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 very few uh, people left on earth that, were, that are that old. 
And so this prophecy is slowly being altered by the society. They're doing it very, very slowly, uh, very deliberately, but they, they have learned that sudden prophetic changes are not good for religions like theirs. And so they're doing it very slowly. They're introducing new understandings of groups and so on and so forth. And um, it used to be back in the 1980s, if you got the Awake magazine, the, uh, the banner for the Awake magazine would be talking about proclaiming the good news uh, concerning Christ and visible return in 1914 and all the rest of this stuff. That's all disappeared. That's all gone now. Uh, witnesses in the 1980s knew all about 1914. Uh, witnesses in 2012 know considerably less about 1914 uh, because it's talked about much less in their literature. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, historically, the society first taught that Christ returned invisibly in 1874 and that Armageddon would take place in 1914, 1915, 1918, 1925, 1943, and 1975 so far. Those are the, there's a, a brief list of the various false prophecies of the society. Um, you would think that Harold Camping would have taken a clue from uh, the witnesses, but he did not. And uh, so we see what happened today. Uh, y'all, y'all know Harold Camping, right? Y'all remember May 21st and all that stuff? I, when I was in, when I was in uh, uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, riding the train into, into downtown Glasgow. All, every stop had, the end is near, May 21st, uh, 2011, you know, all over the place. And it was, uh, it was sad uh, because, you know, I see all these pl people walking by these and they're going to be sitting there on May 22nd and May 23rd and, and uh, yet again, uh, the faith takes a, a shot in the eye because of a false teacher. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the only person to have ever debated Harold Camping on his false prophecy? <laughs> yeah, that was me. Yep, we had a debate about, uh, oh, I don't know, about, nine, uh, about 10, 11 months beforehand in 2010. And I even offered during the debate, I said, Harold, on May 22nd, I will gladly uh, take over for you on uh, the open forum, and I'll do a week's worth of programs on how to actually interpret the Bible. And uh, he didn't find that funny at the time. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, he's, he's issued a partial apology this past week, so maybe, uh, maybe now he'd take me up on it, I don't know. Now, so all of that helps us understand that why the percentage of partakers is decreasing. The number of partakers as a percentage keeps decreasing as that generation gets older and older. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society teaches God stopped calling people into the anointed class in 1935. Um, now, if you remember 1935, I'm not trying to pick on you, but you're one of our senior citizens. And uh, that generation is surely uh, passing away and passing away quickly. Now, what does the Bible say about three classes? Well, I would just suggest you write these texts down and take a look at them. We're not, because I still have all the New World Translation material to get through, uh, I'm not going to uh, invest my time in looking at them. But in essence, in Romans chapter 8, we are told that either you are uh, in Christ or you're outside of Christ. You're either spiritually alive or you're spiritually dead. You're either in the spirit or you're in the flesh. There is no intermediate group. Uh, it, it's like being partially pregnant. You can't be partially pregnant. Either you are or you're not. Either you're justified or you're not justified. Either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. Uh, this idea of a middle position just simply has no biblical foundation whatsoever. And if we look at the book of Revelation, the great crowd in Revelation chapter 7 is around the throne of God in heaven. It's not on some paradise earth someplace. Uh, and they even have to try to twist the meaning of the book of Revelation at that particular uh, point as well. So it is a fruitful uh, area of discussion to challenge the witnesses on this particular issue. And hence, the biblical uh, text might be of assistance to you at that, at that point. Let's take, take a look at some startling t statistics and then look at the New World Translation. The 1974, oh, went, went past it too quickly, sorry about that. 1974 baptisms, 193,990. 1999 baptisms, 
323,439, a 67% increase. Note, 2010 baptisms, 294, 368, a 9% decrease. And so their numbers are down. Uh, it's difficult being an authoritarian cult in a postmodern society. Um, but their numbers worldwide are down, even though uh, 294 or approximately 300,000 baptisms is a pretty healthy number for the vast majority of denominations which are experiencing decrease uh, in the number of, uh, of baptisms. The 1974 memorial attendees, 4.5 million. Uh, 2010 memorial attendees, 18.7 million, a percentage increase of 311 percent during that time period. And again, those attending that is a little bit more of an accurate number reflecting the people who are influenced by the society than the number of active publishers is. Uh, the number of active publishers, uh, again, putting in 10 hours a week, most denominations would disappear if we, if we numbered them based upon that kind of, of numeration. All right? Okay. Now, New World Translation. How many of you have ever seen the, uh, the New World Translation? I mean, I, obviously, I have the pastors here, but uh, when the Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, uh, have you noticed they normally carry a book bag with them? Or at least one of the uh, people in the group will have a, a book bag with them. And they have their publications, they have their watchtowers, they have their awakes. They have um, uh, books, uh, field service ministry manuals uh, that uh, they will use that have questions in them. And they can look up answers to the questions that might be asked of them, uh, something, like, uh, something like that. Uh, and then, of course, they will have the New World Translation. And uh, along with this, they'll have a blue case-bound volume called the Kingdom Interlinear Translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures. Uh, and this is, well, let, let's just put it this way. If Christianity is a religion of the book, if you twist the book, you twist the faith. And that's what this is. I describe it here as the single most dangerous piece of anti-Christian literature around. Um, because it is anti-Christian, it fundamentally alters the teachings concerning Christ. Uh, the first time, I remember one of the very first times I ever met with Jehovah's Witnesses, I was a second year Greek student at the time in Bible college. And uh, at the time, I was not aware that John 1.1 is not the best place to go when talking with Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not that John 1.1 is not an important verse. As Shane was pointing out in the introduction, it is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They mistranslated as the Word was a God. Um, but it's just that Jehovah's Witnesses can respond to that verse in a comatose state. It takes no thought on their part at all to respond to John 1.1. 1, 1. You bring it up, they've, they've been, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. You want to try to get independent thought started in their minds and getting them to rehearse and re-say something they've said a thousand times before isn't going to do that. But I didn't know that at that point. And uh, so John 1.1 1, 1 came up. And there's a woman sitting across from me. She's a housewife. She's a housewife. And she gives me a three and a half to four minute long pre-memorized speech on the significant of, significance of the lack of the definite article in the third clause of John 1.1 1, 1 in Greek. And it sounded really great, except that I was a second year Greek student and I had a Greek text in my hand. It wasn't an interlin interlinear. In fact, personally, I find interlinears to be a complete waste of trees. Um, seriously. I mean, if you, and if you don't know enough Greek, an interlinear will do no good for you. And if you know enough Greek, you don't need the interlinear. So uh, it just, they exist. They ex uh, I'm, something's going on here, I can tell right now, the way Shane's turned around looking at people. And, um, I, I am just a tremendous foe of interlinears. Uh, in fact, when I taught Greek for Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary for a number of years, I told my students, uh, I install a special feature in the doorway of this classroom. If you walk into this classroom uh, with an interlinear, you will receive 20,000 volts. Um, and uh, I think they believed me. Uh, they're just, they're just, they're just absolute waste of paper. Anyway, uh, so I had an actual Greek text, so it's just the Greek text. 
And so I took it and I handed it across to her and I said, could you show me a Greek article? Now she's just given me a three and a half, four minute speech on Greek articles. And she didn't even know which way to hold the text, let alone could she find a Greek article. She didn't know what it was. Now, did I do that just to embarrass her? No. I was pointing out the fact that she was trusting what the Watchtower Island Tract Society had taught her. But at the same time, I hope we feel somewhat um, intimidated by the fact uh, that here's someone who's at least concerned enough to have taken the time to have memorized something like that because they think it's true. Um, but it was, it, was a learning, it was a learning experience on my part. And, uh, and by the way, before we look at these mistranslations, um, whatever you do, and I don't care whether it's the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, please do not leave this place and go run into one of these people and without doing your own study, without doing more looking into these things, start talking about something like, well, the Greek says, or after the section on Mormonism going, well, Joseph Smith made a false prophecy at such and such a place. Because they'll catch you out. They'll catch you out. Um, I was sitting in a restaurant with a friend of mine. Uh, he was a an employer over a number of people, and one of his employees had asked him to meet with him to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. So this is off of, this is away from work. Um, and we met together at a Denny's or something like that. Uh, uh, the employer and I had just ridden like 80 miles on a bike together or something like that and gotten cleaned up and went to lunch with these guys. And uh, we started talking with this fellow, and I could tell immediately this Jehovah's Witness was a very sharp guy. He, he knew his stuff very, very well. And very quickly, we got into some key issues, and one of them was Colossians chapter 1, which I'll show you here in a moment, the mistranslation that's found there. And I said, well, it's just, uh, I'm sorry, but that, that's just not a, an appropriate translation whatsoever. And he goes, oh, do you read Greek? And I said, yes, I do. And he opens up his New World Translation, and he turns to the front, and he, he takes out a folded piece, small piece of yellowed paper, and he opens it up and he slides it across the table to me and he says, what does that say? And there you had two lines of hand-copied Greek. And like I said, the paper is yellowed from age. And he sort of sits back. I looked at it and I said, well, you, you actually miscopied this letter right here, but what the whole thing says is let no one take you captive through empty, empty philosophy. And his eyes became big as saucers. He said, I have carried that piece of paper for more than 20 years. And you're the first person. I've had many people claim to be able to read Greek. And you're the first person who actually read it. So be careful before you say, well, the Greek says, really? Translate that. <laughs> uh, be careful because later on in the conversation, uh, I slid a paper across to him. At the time, I was a scholar in residence at Grand Canyon University, and I, I slid a, a paper that I had written. Uh, the, the Watchtower had just massacred uh, Ignatius of Antioch and had totally grossly misrepresented him. I was teaching church history at the time. And uh, so I gave him a copy of the paper I had written on it, and he, he's looking down, and he goes, Oh, James White. We know James White. And I just went... And he looks up, and it's like there's a snake. He's about ready to, you know. And uh, it turns out, actually, he had heard me on local radio stations and sort of wanted to do what I do in apologetics, but as a Jehovah's Witness. So we had a, we had a very good conversation. The point is, be able to back up what you're saying. Don't, don't run out of here and say, well, the Greek here says, and they go, oh, really? And, and then it causes a major problem. We already looked at John 1.1. 1, 1. Here you have the New World Translation. In the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They base all of this on a, uh, just a simplistic misunderstanding, uh, even though they will have some very complex defenses of it. I have debated one Jehovah's Witness formally. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses will not do public debates, and he is no longer a Jehovah's Witness. I knew he wouldn't be for very long. Uh, they actually excommunicate, uh, the term they use is disfellowship, uh, people uh, who do that kind of thing, partially because uh, to do what this fellow uh, does in defending the Watchtower Society. He had to read my books. He had to read uh, my book on the Trinity. He had to read Robert Bowman's stuff. He had to read what's called apostate literature. And you're not allowed to do that. 
And so he's now started his own cult called the Witnesses of Yah, um, J-A-H. It's, uh, you know, I don't know it's going to go anywhere, but you never know. Most people didn't think the Watchtower side would go anywhere and certainly didn't think Joseph Smith was going anywhere either. So uh, who knows what it could be 100 years from now. But um, there are some very complex defenses of this mistranslation and this misunderstanding of what's going on in John 1.1. 1, 1. But again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you don't want to go to this text with one of Jehovah's Witnesses at the beginning of your conversation. Once you've established some foundations, maybe, but not in the beginning of your conversation, not when you're trying to get this person to actually start thinking on their own. Uh, because if they're going door to door, they know how to respond to John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, it doesn't even get the thought process started in their mind. John 8.58, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. Instead of uh, ego I me, I am, which uh, we don't have time now, though it's a wonderful study. There's, uh, I've got an entire chapter in my book, The Forgotten Trinity, on the I am sayings of Jesus, John 8, 24, 8, 58, 13, 19, 18, 5 through 6. Uh, it is very clear to me that Jesus uses this phraseology in a very important way of himself. Um, but the point, of course, of the translation of the New World Translation is to remove the the language that Yahweh uses of himself in Exodus 3.14 being used of Jesus. Let me just mention briefly, uh, the best way to handle the I am sayings is not to go from John 8.58 back to Exodus 3.14. Uh, the best way to present this is, is to look at John, all of John's uses and find that he's really drawing this from Isaiah and the minor prophets, especially Zechariah and Zephaniah and Isaiah, the, minor, the major prophet. Uh, and then from that make the connection back to Exodus 3.14. Because in Exodus 3.14, when God says, I am that I am, uh, I share I share in Hebrew, uh, the Greek is ego I me ha'on. I am the one existing. And the one existing is ha'on, not ego I me. So even though ego I me is used there, um, a sharp witness, and there are plenty of sharp witnesses, will catch you up on that. So... Make sure that you're looking at it in, in the appropriate fashion. Oops, might be good to go the right direction. Romans 9.5. Uh, New World Translation says, To whom the forefathers belong and from whom the Christ sprang according to the flesh, colon, God who is over all be blessed forever. Amen. So they put a, pretty much a full stop so that Jesus is not being described as God. You can compare the New King James which says, Of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Um, now again, uh, there, I think there's good reasons to see that Romans 9.5 was a reference to the deity of Christ. Different English translations are more or less clear in uh, rendering in that way. The New King James seems to be the clearest. Uh, again, a full discussion of the syntax, patristic uses from the early church, etc., etc., uh, found in uh, the Forgotten Trinity. I mentioned to you Colossians chapter 1. And I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, uh, the word other was in quotes. This is why. Uh, here is the New World Translation. You'll notice uh, the word other is in brackets. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, because by means of him all other things were created in the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, and whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. He is before all other things. And by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Now, when the New World Translation first came out in the 1950s, there were no brackets around the word other. And there was such a hue and cry on the part of New Testament scholars that they inserted the brackets in the later editions of the New World Translation. Uh, but they still will defend this insertion. And you can see why they have to put it in there. If Jesus is Michael the Archangel, uh, then he did not create all things. He created all other things because he himself is created. And so they stick the word other in there. And if you really are really, really interested, the defense they use is they use what's called the partitive genitive uh, in the firstborn of all creation in verse 15. Um, they're big on going, going to that term. They think firstborn means first created. The Greek term prototokos does not mean the first created. Uh, and in fact, it's Old Testament usage is the one who has preeminence over all things. Uh, but they think it means the first one created, that is the first one created by Jehovah God, and that's how they defend their mistranslation. It clearly is a mistranslation because it turns Paul's entire argument on its head. They don't really 
concern themselves about that because the exegesis of the scripture in its original context is irrelevant to the Watchtower Society. All you have to do is look at their eschatology and you can see that. Um, finding all sorts of wild stuff to come up with the idea of 1914 and 1874 and every other number in between uh, shows that the actual original meaning of the text is irrelevant to the society. It's maintaining the society's authority and existence that is the all in all. Now, Colossians 2.9 is one that I would recommend to your memorization. Uh, uh, I, I think in most of the situations where you're dealing either with Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, to be dependent upon the 28th book of the New Testament called Concordance uh, to find your verses. I'll stop here, let the coffee kick in, you all can go, wait a minute, there's no, oh, and then you can figure out what I'm talking about. Uh, you don't want to be looking up verses in a conversation with Jehovah's Witnesses because most of the time they're not looking them up. They already have them memorized. And that means they're in control of the conversation. And one of the things that I've frequently heard from Christians who, who have talked with Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they go, I still feel like I got anywhere. We covered so many different, there's so many different topics that we covered, and it just didn't feel like we really accomplished anything. Uh, if you want to control the conversation, you have to have scripture memorized. It's just absolutely necessary. When I met with my first two Mormon missionaries, um, I had 186 verses memorized. I still have the list. I still have the piece of paper someplace that I would memorize them and review them every few weeks and so on and so forth. I had 186 verses memorized. Within six months after starting studying Mormonism, I had 654 verses memorized. Why? Because when you're talking with a missionary, normally two missionaries, Sometimes when you're out at uh, the Mesa Easter pageant or in Salt Lake City outside the gates of the temple, five or six missionaries. I even walked into the missionary training center in Provo, Utah and was surrounded by about a thousand missionaries. Um, you do not have time to be looking up texts. You've got to have the word of God memorized. And I, I would highly recommend to all of us today, uh, it is sadly a lost art for most people. And yet... Uh, don't you remember back in vacation Bible school? Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. How many of us memorized that in vacation Bible school, huh? Um, it, we've, we, we are so dependent on our devices. And I'm, the, I'm, we're, I'm terrible. I am a device junkie. I mean, I've got my droid right there. I've got an iPad in there, a Kindle in there, a MacBook Pro here. I've got an iPod Touch that... Uh, I, I lost on a cruise, but somebody found. They're shipping it back to me, but I still haven't gotten it yet. But anyways, uh, and, you know, uh, I've got all my stuff on there because I need to have all my stuff on there. I mean, I'll go out to, when I go to London, I go out with a group of, of folks that do street ministry in Leicester Square. Anybody been to Leicester Square in London? It's like Disneyland, except it's real. The buildings are real. It's that beautiful. You know how they have the, the facades in Disneyland? It looks like... That's what Leicester Square really is, and it's real. It's, it's just gorgeous, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It's down near the, the, uh, uh, the... Excuse me, but haven't we had enough of this? I can see my wife outside right now, out on the beach, going, ah! you know, oh, that poor thing. Oh, well. Anyways, you shall not do this late this afternoon. Uh, that's just all I can say. Okay, anyhow, uh, where was I? Moses and the bulrushes and um, um, London, London. And so what we do is we'd have a street preacher. He starts preaching, and the Muslims show up almost immediately. And so the group around, we set them out, and they bring all the Muslims over to me. And so I spend the whole night talking to the Muslims. So I've got on my, on my, my iPod, I've got the Quran, and I've got the Hadith, and I've got the Greek text, and, and uh, the textual critical material, because the Muslims will say, well, you've changed this, you've changed that. All of it. You know, I understand the gadget stuff. Uh, I'm, I am a gadget geek. But as a result, we very rarely memorize the Bible anymore. And it's, um, it's not a good thing. This is one I would suggest your memorization, partly because it's so nice and short. <laughs> um, it's not, not a long one. Uh, I'm sort of reminded of the Lollards. You all know who the Lollards were, the followers of John Wycliffe uh, prior to the Reformation. And uh, they would actually memorize the English translation of the Bible. And what they would do is each person would memorize one of the books of the New Testament. So you'd have John, and John would get up in uh, the Lollard meetings, and he would quote from the Gospel of John that he had memorized. I think I'd be third John, uh, you know, something like that. 
and uh, Shane would be uh, Jude, and uh, you know, we'd uh, get along real well that way. Anyway, um, so people did memorize them. Colossians 2.9, because this is the New World Translation. Because it is in him that all the fullness of the divine quality dwells bodily. Compare the New American Standard. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Hati enotoika toikai ponta pleroma te theate tas somatikos. Theate tas. That's what I wrote on the, uh, we, went to, we went to lunch uh, the day before yesterday and I, they write on the tables at this place and so I wrote out, uh, it must have been odd when the waiter came by and I wonder what that is, you know. Uh, Colossians 2.9 in Greek. Theate tas means that which makes God God. It's not a divine quality. You won't find a lexicon anywhere that says divine quality. It's that which makes God God. And what Colossians 2.9 is saying is that in him, this is present tense, is dwelling all the fullness of deity in bodily form. And if the bodily form there is referring to his resurrection form, I mean, this is an extremely important uh, text. And uh, given that Paul is speaking against a proto-Gnostic heresy, it makes a lot of sense. So again, discussion of that uh, found in uh, the Forgotten Trinity. Revelation 3.14, uh, these are the things that the Amen says, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation by God. So they say, see, right there, Jesus is the beginning of the creation by God, and then everything else is created through him. Uh, the NRSV has the words, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. The NIV and LT have the ruler. Most have just simply beginning of the creation of God, because the Greek term arche, uh, can have numerous meanings, beginning, origin, source, etc., etc. The problem is their translation of the term by God rather than of God is where, again, they are, are stretching. I wouldn't call it a mistranslation, but they are stretching uh, the realm of possibility greatly. Finally, Granville Sharp's rule uh, is found in Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And I'm going to need to... I've got another graphic I need to put in here. I, I, someone needs to remind me of this because I just uh, realized this. S Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Uh, now, the rule, in essence, would tell us that God and Savior are both in reference to Christ Jesus. That Jesus is being described as both God and Savior. It's not our God and then and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the New World Translation says, while well, we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and of the Savior of us, Christ Jesus. Now, the basic rule is when you have two singular nouns that are not names connected by chi, the Greek word and, the first having the article and the second not having it, both nouns are describing the same person. Now, this is actually just one of six rules that the English abolitionist and uh, Greek scholar Granville Sharp identified right around the years, well, late 1790s, early 1800s. Uh, when I was in uh, Bible college, I, I did an extensive study of Granville Sharp's rule, actually tracked down one of the uh, earlier publications of his, uh, of his work. Uh, in Titus 2.13, you can clearly demonstrate that in Titus 2.13, the only person in view is Christ, and the language used of him is drawn directly from these Old Testament texts. Again, our time does not really allow us to go extensively into all of these things. But if you'll look back at Psalm 130, verses 7 through 8, Exodus 37, 23, and, and I'm sorry, Ezekiel 37, 23, and Exodus 19, 5, you will see that what Paul is doing in writing to Titus is he is drawing specific language of redemption that is specifically about Jehovah God and applying it to Jesus' work in his words to Titus. And so we can look back at the Old Testament context. We can say, see, these are things that Jehovah does. And then look at Titus chapter 2 and say, see, what is being said in the context is that Jesus is Jehovah and we are looking for the, great, the appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that this is not some separate God. This is not some other God. This is Jehovah manifest in the flesh. This is the Son of God who has come and is dwelling amongst us. And again, uh, your knowledge of the Trinity and your knowledge of your own faith will be greatly deepened by taking the time to know how to respond to Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but it's always best to do that before talking to the Witnesses, uh, not afterwards. Uh, that's, that's sort of getting it backwards, shall we say. So uh, keep, that, uh, 
keep that in mind. It's all right. It's clear on the other side. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't that great? That's uh, lovely. Uh, it would be pretty wild if it was raining over here and it wasn't over there. That would be, uh, that would be, that'd be pretty interesting. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, New American Standard says, By the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, the New World Translation says, By the righteousness of our God and the Savior Jesus Christ. Again, trying to make a division. Now, you don't have a context in the introduction to an epistle, but what you do have is the fact that in 2 Peter, Peter utilizes... Um, four Granville Sharp constructions. And this is what's interesting. In all the other places, the New World Translation accurately translates the Granville Sharp constructions because it doesn't challenge their theology. When it comes to 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, they mistranslate it because it challenges their theology. So, for example, uh, on the screen, uh, we have 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 2 Peter 1.11 compared to one another. Uh, the top two lines in Greek, the next two lines in the transliteration of the Greek, and then in English, the bottom two lines. And you can see, looking at any one, the only difference between 1.1 1, 1 and 1.11. The word order is identical. Everything is identical, except that in 1.1 1, 1 it's our God, and in 1.11 it's our Lord. And no translation that I know of says our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, as if we have a Lord and then someone else who's Savior. But at John 1.1, 1, 1, they don't want to say our God and Savior. So, no matter what else you say, the writer of 2 Peter, which I believe was Peter, a lot of people say wasn't, but uh, the writer of 2 Peter is communicating one thing with great clarity, and that is for him, Jesus is our God and Savior. Otherwise, he wouldn't use the exact same form of the language in these other places uh, to communicate what he does. Okay? It just, it just would not make uh, a lick of sense. All right? Now, um, looking at the clock and trying to be as, as uh, efficient with time as we possibly can be, Um, what I'd like to do is I would like to preemptorily answer a question uh, before we take our break. And if, I've, if, I, if we're more efficient, maybe we can get to lunch a little bit earlier or something like that. We'll just we'll see how this works. 